All right. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And we are continuing our journey through the uh, Bodhisattva Akshayamati Sutra, Bodhisattva Inexhaustible Intellect or Inexhaustible Mind. And we have been experiencing the visions, the visions of a bodhisattva through the successive stages of the bodhisattva path, the 10 Bhumi stages. And tonight we are about to abide in the seventh Bhumi stage. This is the Bhumi stage. It is called Duram Gama, which means gone afar gone beyond and that's sort of the theme for tonight of is the idea is this idea of going beyond this uh gone afar um i'll have a lot to say about that idea of going afar as we move along um but i want to before we before we get into this before we get into this vision that the Bodhisattva has before abiding in this seventh level, I want to remind you of something that happened. <laughs> and that was, we began this journey through this sutra by exploring the 10 paramitas, the 10 perfections, the 10 excellences, the 10 uh, practices of a Bodhisattva. And we spent basically a night on each of the paramitas and we went through them all. However, if you go back and check the record, you'll remember that I paused at the seventh paramita. And I, I wanted to draw a big distinction between the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth paramitas and then the seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th paramitas. And I, you know, I wanted to do that for a number of reasons that that night, there was a number of reasons why I wanted to, to do that uh, break. Uh, I kind of, you know, having explored the 10 stages, I, I you know, I knew there, there is this implicit or implied uh, distinction between the six stages and then the seventh eighth ninth and tenth stages but back when we were doing the paramitas and i paused for a moment it was i really wanted to pause on the 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 real difference in the quality of the seventh paramita which is the paramita of upaya so upaya is this really very profound a uh, Buddhist idea, very Mahayana Buddhist idea of skillful means or skillfulness. Um, and I've talked a lot about Upaya and I'm sure it'll come up tonight. So I'm not gonna uh, uh, digress into a conversation about Upaya. But the idea was though, is that that ability upaya, this skillfulness, the skillful means, this, this ability to, to um, well, basically upaya is this ability to create a good example, to create a heroistic device, to, to, to teach, to educate. And of course, what is implied in, in upaya is that it is a, a, a relational situation. That, that, is, that you can't do kind of upaya on your own in that way. And in particular, what I'm getting at is that the, this, the stages seven, eight, nine, and 10 are really advanced stages of the bodhisattva. And so part of the well, the first way, let's put it that way, the first way to think about Duram Gama, the, the, state, the seventh stage of gone afar, the idea of this is that the Bodhisattva at this stage is truly next level. 
<laughs> like to 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 employ the the common parlance of the day this is next level okay <clears throat> and so i just wanted to remind you of that that there was even in the paramitas a distinction being made between the six paramitas and then upaya and beyond and so this is that stage in which the bodhisattva is about to abide in the seventh stage, which sort of corresponds to upaya in that way. So we're going to think about that. Uh, but without any further ado, let's read the, the vision. Um, <clears throat> this is another one where it's a pretty simple, I think this is actually, it might be the simplest it might be the shortest i didn't measure uh, numbers of chinese characters or anything <clears throat> excuse me but here we go when a bodhisattva is about to abide in the far reaching stage the stage of durangama gone afar the seventh stage the Bodhisattva will first have a vision of hells to their left and to their right, and they will see themselves passing through them unharmed. That's the vision. Hells to the left, yeah, hells to the right, yeah, and the vision is passing through them unharmed all right <laughs> so that's that's where we're going to start tonight <clears throat> that's the vision the bodhisattva about to abide in the seventh stage has a vision of themselves and has a vision of themselves with hells to the left and to the right and the vision is passing through them unharmed all right so i it's it's really this is a very funny this is funny it's funny how this um dharma talk is, it, it comes together so i myself i myself had a kind of a reaction to this where it was like like <clears throat> hell realms like really we're good we're gonna go we're we're i thought that it's like <clears throat> you know i mean i think we were talking about emptiness and like you know crazy stuff hells hell realms come on buddha right and what's funny is is that having that kind of reaction and i'm you know this is a this is kind of a, a minimal reaction to me where i'm thinking Oh no, <laughs> you know, how am I gonna teach this? Because yeah, because I know, I know it's like hell realms. But what's funny is, is that as soon as I was thinking, I, I, I read the vision and I was like, oh wow, this is gonna be tricky and all of that. And then I remembered, I remembered. So just to start us off tonight, just to sort of like, really to set the mood tonight. <clears throat> there is this really great, uh, I guess it's a Zen story. It's kind of one of those things that if you can't remember, it's a Zen story, right? And so it's a great Zen, the Zen master story. And it, I really like this story and it's told, it's told a lot of ways. This is Upaya, right? This is tonight, right? And so it's like told a bunch of different ways, but the way that I tell it is there was a, this is in Japan and medieval, you know, medieval Japan. And there was a samurai who had been studying with uh, a great Zen master. And he had learned all about dependent origination and emptiness and all these you know, profound ideas and all this and that. And he came to his master one day, the samurai, and he said, you know, master, this, this Dharma, this Buddhism, you know, it's so profound. The, the Buddha is just so wise, this teaching, it's so, um, it makes so it's so rational it makes so much sense it's about my mind and about this and this and that 
He says, it's, it's so rational. I don't understand something. Why do these Buddhists talk about these hell and heaven and this? Aren't they beyond that way of thinking? And the Zen master says, oh, oh, yeah. And he says something basically along the lines of like, well, you know, there, there's no way that you could understand those teachings because you're of such and such a family and you're just a samurai and this and that. And well, the samurai got, gets a little offended and he's like, well, you know, but he wants to be respectful to his master. And he's like, well, master, I think I could understand really. Like, and then the Zen master says, no, 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 no. There's no way that you could understand because your whole life is about the sword and about violence and all of that. There's, there's no way that you could possibly understand. And now the samurai is getting really, because now he's been, the, the, he's insulted his family, he's insulted his occupation and all of this. And then finally, you know, the, the, Zen, the Zen master just starts laying into him about, well, you know, actually he's been a great disappointment and he's actually not really too smart and all this stuff. And at that point, the samurai is furious and he stands up and he, and he grabs the hilt of his sword. And at that point, the Zen master says, yes, yes, that's it. Open the gates of hell. And at that very moment, the, the, the samurai says, oh, master, open the gates of heaven. And it's, it's, a, it's a great story, of course, about what the Buddhists mean by the hell realms and what they mean by heavenly realms as well. And what they mean, you know, by equanimity. It's a really funny story, of course, where these hell realms are very real in that sense. And so again, just to cut off any confusion in the beginning, that Zen story, I think, speaks to the hell realms that are being uh, transcended that, are, that stand to the left and to the right of this bodhisattva, and this bodhisattva sees themselves passing unharmed, right? Now, I, I'm gonna have a lot more to say about this vision and, and this idea of these hell realms, but I definitely wanted to say that one from the beginning, because it so speaks to um, anybody who might have that kind of reaction. I'm like, hell realms? Like, really? I thought, you know, I thought the Buddhists were atheists or they don't believe in the super, supernatural or whatever. Not at all. They just sort of have a very poetic way of speaking about a lot of these things, human emotional states and what have you. Okay, so any, anything to start regarding just the general layout of the vision? Any samurais in the audience really still... Um, <laughs> Michael, that reminds me a little bit of um, the story of Buddha when he um, was sitting under the Bodhi tree and, you know, contemplated and meditated on um, emptiness and, and suffering and life existence and ultimate reality. And then suddenly, I don't know, on, on one, at, at one day, as on, on which day, Mara came, you know. And uh, Mara can be seen, you know, like uh, desire, you know, desire, attachment, and uh, obstacles. So that's, I think, you know, that's what I see with hell realms. I see them more than, or I understand them more like, you know, these, um, yeah, desire, attachment, stuff like that. And but I was just mentioning that because, you know, also Mara came not right away. It came, he, he or she came, you know, after some time. And um, yeah, so mm -hmm. anyway. It, exactly, Connie. And, and I really do think that, I mean, again, I'm going to say a little bit more, um, I guess, cosmological. Logically, if anybody saw my talk on Friday night, I'm going to speak a little bit more cosmologically about the hell realms within the Buddhist tradition and ideas about the Bodhisattva. But I don't ever want to stray too far from basically Connie's comment about Mara and that the idea that these hell realms and these things, the, 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 the Buddhists are speaking very poetically about emotional states, in my opinion. But I don't think that it's like, um, 
helpful to then be like, oh, well then let's stop using the poetic language and let's just talk about my emotional state. Because, you know, I'm a big believer in mythologies. I'm a big believer in that type of use of language. So let's stick with it in that way tonight. But thanks, Connie, for that uh, reminder of this, that story of the Buddha. And actually that's important, Connie. All, well, all, everybody, everybody has such excellent questions and comments and ideas. I, I, uh, Connie's comment about the Buddha under the Bodhi tree. I wanna remind everybody that the Bodhisattva, what a Bodhisattva is, is someone bound for the Bodhi tree. That is exactly the idea. And so when we, um, in the Mahayana tradition, when we stop looking at the events of the Buddha, like the events of Siddhartha, when we stop looking at them as historical events, and more archetypal events in the kind of Jungian sense, then you kind of begin to look at, oh, the, the Buddha was born in a palace with everything he wanted, but eventually became dissatisfied with those pleasures and left the palace. And you start to realize, oh, that's a, this is all a metaphor, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a metaphor for the spiritual journey in that way. And so that's what the Bodhisattva is. And yes, we will all eventually sit under that Bodhi tree and have to confront Mara in that way. And perhaps we are all currently presently sitting under the Bodhi tree confronting Mara in that way, no? So, <laughs> okay. Um, let me, so before I get to the more deeper philosophical stuff, let's, um, yeah, let's, let's deal with the cosmological stuff. So let, I, there is this kind of cosmological idea. And by the way, when I start to go cosmological on you, <laughs> don't forget everything I just said. <laughs> Like we are about to begin speaking very poetically and cosmologically about the same stuff we were just talking about. But cosmologically speaking, the Bodhisattva who reaches the seventh stage, one of the ways of reading Durham Gama, one of the re one of the ways of reading this vision is that the idea is that cosmologically, the Bodhisattva in the seventh stage is not just beyond rebirth in the hell realms, but sort of like beyond experiencing the hell realms. And again, if you think, if you recall what the hell realms mean, <laughs> then it's an interesting place for the Bodhisattva to be in of having actually fully transcended that. And I, I kind of, yeah, I want to say this now, and it's just to anybody, anybody who's um, interested in comparing these stages to uh, Hinayana stages, early Buddhist ideas of stages of de development, there is definitely a sense in which the Bodhisattva who has reached the seventh stage is kind of an arhat sort of, kind of, maybe, it's sort of an apples and oranges kind of a thing where it's not actually at all good of me or accurate to compare them. But I think it's worth noting that in the Mahayana tradition, the Bodhisattva at this stage has signed, has kind of put an end to the poisons in a way. They have actually kind of ceased the anger arising, the greed arising, the confusion, the delusion, and all of that. And so part of what Durham Gama sort of implies is a going beyond samsara in a way. But if you keep in mind that the bodhisattva path and the bodhisattva practice is one of not abiding in samsara nor nirvana, that's the interesting thing about the bodhisattva path. It's this very, it's truly profound. It's truly profound, truly ineffable, truly indescribable because it is this sort of really interesting place of 
you know, if we understand samsara as delusional suffering, just the, the mundane world of life. And if we think of nirvana as liberation and enlightenment and Buddhahood and all of that, and then we say, yeah, and the bodhisattva is neither there nor there. And, and then you're like, but okay, uh, where are they? <laughs> like, like, whoa, 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 whoa. And the idea is no, it is actually a practice of not identifying, not identifying with the self, not identifying with locality, not identifying with time and, and not identifying. It's actually this profound practice of extreme non-identification that puts one beyond, beyond samsara and nirvana, beyond arhats and all of that. And so I, again, I would suggest that there's a relationship between the original path of the cessation of suffering, the cessation of the poisons. There's a correlation with the, with the point that we've reached, the bodhisattva in the seventh stage, but recognize there's stages to go from from here in, in other words in the mahayana tradition just kind of cleaning up our own act yeah that's just the, the beginning it's not the end <laughs> in that way questions comments ideas about any of that ideas of hell realms the the bodhisattva actually being beyond reincarnation in a hell realm okay so for the bulk of tonight, I'm going to do what I've been doing. It's, it's been working for me so far. So I want to read a little bit from the 10 stages sutra. Um, this is, I feel like this has been a really good way to, um, you know, not so much like it really in a detailed way, explore the stages, but it's been a nice way to introduce you to the way they feel in a sense, and like the way the Avatamsaka Sutra feels. So um, if, if you missed it, these 10 stages are part of Mahayana Buddhism. They're not, they're spoken about not just in the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra, but the, the main place that they're spoken of in, is in the 10 stages Sutra. And so I've been reading parts of this Sutra. It's a very long, big Sutra, but I want to, and, and, and and reading this will give you yet an even uh, better idea of what Durham Gamma means, going beyond, right? So um, uh, in the, in the Avatamsaka Sutra, uh, th uh, throughout the 10 stages sutra at least, we have a wonderful bodhisattva guide named uh, Vajra Matrix. Vajra Matrix Bodhisattva guides us through the 10 stages. And so the Bodhisattva Vajra Matrix has this th to say about the seventh stage. Any Bodhisattva who has thoroughly fulfilled the course of the sixth Bhumi stage comes to the seventh Bhumi stage they gain access to the seventh Bhumi stage by means of 10 kinds of special undertaking in the path, which are accomplished by upaya, pranya, and jnana, skillful means, transcendent wisdom, and knowledge. Which, by the way, those are up, or at least knowledge is the highest of the paramitas. And what are these 10 special undertakings in the path which are accomplished by skill and means, transcendent wisdom and knowledge? The bodhisattva, um, yeah, and let me just read all of these. I'll read all of these and then I'll do what I did before, which is choose ones to kind of focus on. But I'd love for you to hear all 10 of these. Um, uh, just ho hold on. <laughs> and what are these 10? The Bodhisattva develops a mind well-trained in focus on emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness, yet 
they collect great provisions of virtue and knowledge. Number two, they enter into the selflessness, absence of being, absence of soul, absence of individuality, and absence of personality in all things, yet they do not give up the production of the four samgraha, the four means of, or sorry, the four immeasurables. Immeasurable kindness, immeasurable compassion, immeasurable joy, and immeasurable equanimity. Number three, they perform the paramitas to increase virtuous ways, yet they do not cling to anything. Number four, they become detached from everything in the world, yet they produce arrays of wonderful adornments for the world. Number five, they become ultimately calm and tranquil due to the removal from the fires of the afflictions. Yet, they undertake to accomplish the extinction of the flames of afflictions in all beings. Number six, they realize the non-duality of essence of being and non-being. They realize all things being like illusions, mirages, dreams, reflections, echoes, apparitions, yet they put into effect resolution in innumerable different deeds and works. Number seven, they have cultivated the perception that all lands and all paths are equal to empty space, yet they undertake the adornments of Buddha lands. They arrive at the nature of all Buddhas as being fundamentally and essentially the reality body of the cosmos, yet they undertake the production of the adornments of the marks of distinction and embellishments of the physical body of a Buddha. Number nine, they grant that the voice of the Buddha is unutterable, completely free from sound and by nature, ultimately silent. Yet, they undertake the production of pure arrays of all different tones to communicate with all beings. And number 10, in a single instant, they enter the Buddha's awareness of past, present, and future, yet they enter into the various distinctions of various appearances, ages, and reckonings by discernment of beings' minds. By these 10 kinds of special undertaking on the path accomplished by Upaya, Pranya, and Jnana, Bodhisattvas enter the seventh stage and they are said to be in this stage by virtue of the manifestation of the practice of these 10 undertakings. <laughs> okay. So that's a description of the seventh stage. There's a, a lot of a lot of ideas, a lot of information and in everything I just read. It's you know very dense. And you know, and I read this to you to let you know that the Avatamsaka Sutra is a little dense, <laughs> but you know, there's there's great wonder and profundity in the in in that density. The the first thing I want to I want kind of want to say this before I even dive to, into any one of these, which is that the structure of all 10 of these special practices or special, what are they, observances? Undertakings. In this sutra, language is important. So 10 undertakings. And so they undertake these 10 things. And again, I'm gonna go through them or at least I'm gonna choose a few of the juicy ones to dive into. But I want you to see that it, what is being expressed in all of these is this sort of 
it's the basic bodhisattva formula of a bodhisattva understands all sentient beings are illusory and non-existent and empty, yet vows to save them all. And you're like, wait, but vows to save who all? Didn't didn't it just come? Didn't it? Yeah, doesn't a bodhisattva? And it is the, the idea of going beyond. Now, by the way, I'm now about to add to my many interpretations of going beyond. So I don't want anybody to say, wait, I thought you said it was going beyond help. No. So the idea is we are in this sense, like going beyond. And why I say it like that, like just we're going beyond because, for example, let's just dive in. Let's just dive in, right? So I'll deal with the first one because I, I, we, we kind of always need to start in the beginning in that way. So the first undertaking of a bodhisattva who's sort of like starting to abide in the seventh Bhumi, they develop a mind well-trained in focus on emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness. The three, the three doors of liberation, as they're called. Yet, they collect great provisions of virtue and knowledge. So there's sort of a, there's a paradox that is being presented there. And the idea is, is that you know, if we deal with the three doors of liberation, signlessness, wishlessness, and emptiness, right? Or actually, I'll, let me, I'll deal with it in the order they're presented here. Emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness. So we've talked about these definitely in the past, definitely during this sutra. This sutra is, is firmly... Uh, steeped in pranya paramita, in this idea of transcendent wisdom. And pranya paramita, transcendent wisdom, is all about emptiness. It's all about this door or gateway of emptiness. And I talk almost every Sunday night, I talk several times a day about, about this idea of, of emptiness. And it's always, always, always a very hard idea just to jump into. It's all, I always sort of have to kind of just start from the beginning. And I say, oh, I got a clock and here we go, right? It's like every single time I kind of have to go through this process. And first of all, I don't mind doing that. <laughs> Secondly, I understand it's such a, an ephemeral idea. It is so slippery. And the reason why it's so slippery, this idea of emptiness, the emptiness of all phenomena, the reason why it's so slippery is because it's, it's just about, it's thinking a different way. It's, it's, it's actually like, you know, a, fu you know, a funny, uh, uh, I guess an example I could use is, you know, one plus one equals two. That's all well and good until, until you don't get to do math operations for free anymore. Until it costs something to add or to subtract. And so actually one plus one is equal to 1.9 because it takes 0.1 to do the operation. And what I mean is, is that if all of a sudden you were to change the definitions of operations where you don't get to just do math or sorry, addition and subtraction for free anymore, it's gonna cost you. You don't get to do, and oh, you wanna multiply and divide? That's really gonna cost you. Yeah, 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 that's not, <laughs> right? So if you were to start thinking of it that way, it would actually just undo mathematics in a way. Like it would just be a whole new way of thinking. Emptiness is sort of like that, that you kind of, it's, it asks of you to use a different mind, not even a different aspect of your mind in a way, but just a whole different way of thinking. Michael, one, one I want, want, would love to hear your thoughts about that. Um, you know, when we talk about emptiness, the problem with emptiness is, I mean, not the problem, there's no problem, but that we have an kind of a negative connota connotation on emptiness. 
I wish we could just invent something mm -hmm. like nobody has ever heard and explain the essence of empty emptiness through this world and word and not through emptiness mm -hmm. itself. So, yeah. I hear you, Connie. And we're a little, we're a little stuck there in that way that, you know, um, I, I hear you though. I hear you. And I mean, on that, on that note, Connie, I do hear you. And it's why, you know, especially my uh, people have been studying with me for a while, you'll know that I'm, I'm a big, um, uh, how should I say, um, I talk a lot about what I call the fullness. And what I mean by the fullness of things, and, and I don't, you know, I don't even know we're at less than 20 on this. So I have to assume that if you're watching this, you, you have been along the whole time, right? And so what I mean is, if you understand about the emptiness, that that is this sort of, um, well, yeah, I'd really, I'd, I'd like to address this. It's really important. And it's this idea that Yes, Connie, I hear you. And the thing about it is, is the reason why I'm not, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay with emptiness kind of being, I don't want to say negative in that way, but I don't, I don't feel like we need to fix it in that way because the emptiness is actually here to solve a problem. And that problem is a very rigid way of thinking. It's a very, very rigid way of thinking. And yes, this emptiness comes along and sort of removes that rigid conceptual way of thinking. And my, the reason why I speak and teach a lot about the fullness, it's, it's that you only get to that fullness through this emptiness. And what I mean by that is, the emptiness that we are speaking about, and I know that I've probably said this in a Dharma talk, like I probably said it last Sunday and the Sunday before that and the Sunday before that. But one way to understand emptiness, and it, it's sort of, um, it's just one way, just one aspect of this teaching of emptiness is so profound. But one aspect of it is the, the, the ability of the mind to, especially a mind that has all these words for things, it's the ability of the, um, the mind to, to see an, an assemblage, to see an assemblage of items. And the mind has the ability to, to hold it as one object, one, not, a button and this and this and this and a battery and gears and this and this, not the assemblage, but it has the ability to place a name on that assemblage. And as soon as it places a name on that assemblage, it can get um, trapped into thinking, oh, it is one thing. I, I, I have a, I've, be, I've uh, been using this term a lot lately which is, it's a verb, by the way, it's this singularization of phenomena. A singularization is sort of, of holding it off as, it's, as one thing. Oh, look, a pencil, one mechanical pencil. Oh, but it's got an eraser and it's got the lead inside and it's the plastic and I could take, it's actually many things but I can hold it in my mind as just, just the pencil, just the clock, just the Michael. And this is where this is really important to the Dharma in that way. Are the idea of Michael, the name, oh, it's one thing. All, all evidence to the contrary, <laughs> yet the name helps reinforce this idea of singular one being here called Michael with one thing in his hand. And what emptiness is about, so 
hold on. What emptiness is about is about the conceptual, non-real nature of clock, Michael, pencil, that those are just words, that the mind can see things in the world that remember, that remind it of it and be like, oh, look, a clock. Oh, look, Michael again. And where the mind gets messed up is thinking that that is a real one entity, one singularity. Now, the real, real uh, extra dose of emptiness teaching here, if you're following along, is, oh, okay. There's, oh, gotcha, Michael, clock. That's right. But what about the button? and the hands and the face and the bat, th what about those? Well, the same goes for those too. Because if I were to take out, oh, I don't know, let's take out the battery and let's begin. Oh, I did it again. One, one thing, although there's, we got writing, we've got the, co the copper part, the black part. And I'm sure within here, there is the acid, there's the this, there's the that. So I've done it again. And I could take then, okay, let's spill out the acid, the battery acid into my hand. And now is it, is that one thing? Tell me when we get to that one thing. And the idea is you never get to that one thing. It's just gonna be a language game all the way down. And the idea is, is that for a while, we didn't have words for anything smaller than an, an atom. And then we discovered electrons and protons and neutrons, and we didn't have words for anything smaller than that. But then we came up with new words, quarks and this and that, and then we'll come up with new words. And from a Buddhist point of view, this is just coming up with new language, coming up with new words and new ideas. And it could go on and on, and indeed it does go on and on and on. So that's the quick, <laughs> Uh, lesson in emptiness. And the reason why I do that, by the way, that I like to go through that version of emptiness is that when you realize the emptiness of the clock, it's not that this goes away. It's that that clinging to that word and that idea goes away. By the way, sorry for all the ways, I often like to mention, for all the philosophy heads in the room, I often like to mention that this doesn't work. So it really begs the question of whether it's a clock at all. And what I mean by that is, is that this does not keep time. It broke a long time ago. So it doesn't keep time. Right? It doesn't do, it doesn't clock anymore. And the idea is, is that guess what? This doesn't clock either. So if you're going to ca keep calling this a clock, even though it doesn't clock anymore, then you've got to start calling a bunch of things clocks, because there's a bunch of things in this universe that don't clock, <laughs> that don't keep time. So I mean, that's kind of a funny philosophical aside. But it's a very interesting one regarding why do we think anything is what it is? Is it because of potential? This is like Aristotelian logic, by the way, but it's like, is it a, it has the potential to clock? It has the potential to keep time. It is keeping time. Like what exactly is something? And this is a very interesting, emptiness is an interesting exploration of ontology in that way, where it reveals the linguistic nature of being. That's it. Sorry. Had to. Any questions? Yeah, no. I just got a quick comment. I was in a class this morning and the teacher was talking about emptiness. And I swear to God, he held up a little clock. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is it about the clocks and emptiness? It's a good example. <laughs> it's a good example. Okay. So I went off on that. Uh, actually, now I remembered. I went off on that thing about emptiness. Because, so, oh, you, you thought, <laughs> you thought a minute ago that Michael had a clock in his hand. And that's a rigid way of thinking that's conditioned, conditional, 
all of those things. And so the emptiness is freedom from conventional, rigid, conditioned ways of thinking. And my feeling, my, the way I teach this, and this is not just me, Buddhism has a word for this, but when one via emptiness evacuates kind of everything of its conditioned meaning, it opens up the possibility for, I don't know, for this to be a, I don't know, a little hat. Maybe I got cool earrings. The idea is, is that there's a fullness to everything when you realize the emptiness of everything. Does that make sense? Like that idea that if you were so rigidly holding it as a clock, you can now rigidly hold it as anything you would like, <laughs> yeah. in a way. Hey, Jimmy. Noe, was that you? I was just agreeing with you. Yes. Yay. <laughs> okay. Everybody cool with emptiness? Connie, you okay with that it's okay that it's negative? Something to that effect? Sweet. So that idea that it, yeah, it's like it is kind of negative. And, it, and by the way, there's a kind of a, um, within the world of Buddhism, there's a little bit of a, a critique of Zen Buddhism for staying a little too long in the emptiness and not going to the other side and not a critique by me, by the way, I mean by other schools of Buddhism where they're like, yeah, that Zen school is a little dark. And there's jokes about why Zen monks wear black robes because of the emptiness and their obsession with emptiness. And so I just want you to know that there is sort of a Buddhist tradition of being kind of somberly deep in the emptiness. And it's, you know, it's like, you know, different strokes for different folks in that way. But I never like that teaching or that way of approaching emptiness. I never like for that to be the final word on emptiness because I'm such a big proponent of it as a freeing device in, in the way that I've been describing. And Michael, isn't there a saying in Buddhism, but I'm not sure if it's Buddhism or if I've read it um, somewhere else, they say, or it is said like that um, the space is empty and, and at the same time it's pregnant with possibilities. And yeah. I always like, like, like that a lot. It, exactly, exactly a beautiful way of saying what I was getting at with this idea of the fullness. And, you know, I hope everybody can feel how it's, it, it's sort of the emptiness sort of reveals the deep rigidity of conditional ways of thinking. And in the kind of dukkha way, there's a way in which that's kind of a straight jacket of thinking where it keeps one really bound. And when one is freed from this, again, it's not that this sort of ceases to be a clock. It just starts to become so much more than that. Whereas a clock is just one possibility within, you know, millions and millions and millions in that way. Okay, so emptiness, all phenomena, whether it's a clock or Michael or my water bottle or whatever, emptiness. I'm not gonna go too deep into the signlessness and wishlessness, just really quickly though, the idea is that these are these three doors of liberation. We've spoken about them before. And there's a very, very, very simple way of thinking how about how these three interrelate. So the idea is, is that my clock is red and the redness is a quality of my clock. But if I've gotten rid of that idea of the clock, what's red? And that is sort of one way of thinking of signlessness, which is a, it's a weird, it's a kind of a weird aspect of emptiness, which is that if individual things don't exist as individual things, then the qualities or signs, the qualities of those things well, they get a little funny <laughs> in that way where it's like, where, wait a minute. And I've done talks in the past about phenom the phenomenalism of Buddhism 
And of course, the idea that color arises actually in the mind and is not out there. It's kind of in here in that way. So signlessness is about how qualities like color, shape, size, auditory quality, we think they're out there, but they're actually emergent in, in the in-between. This is reliant upon the idea of emptiness. So it's empty, but the phenomenal experience is real, if you will. There's no denying experience in Buddhism. There's no denying phenomenal experience. It's just about when we get carried away and start calling it concrete reality. So all phenomena is empty and therefore without any characteristics. And if all phenomena, clocks and all this stuff, if it's ultimately just an idea in my head, meaning the singularity of the idea of clock is just an idea in my head, and the qualities that I think that clock has are also just in my head, <laughs> The idea here is, is that if you really, if you really follow this phenomenalism about how the idea of the thing is in my head and the qualities are in my head and all of this, then what that should ultimately produce, if, if you have sort of grokked it properly, is that this becomes undesirable. There's nothing here to be desired. That's the third door of liberation, which is the desirelessness of everything. The, 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 the idea, the, the wisdom is this idea that none of this is happiness producing in that way. That's the idea. I think it is. Trust me. I know. I think it is too. But the idea is that that is causing the suffering and the dukkha in a variety of ways. And so one can kind of have this realization via emptiness of the undesirability of everything. And the beauty of this, by the way, is that, you know, it's kind of this, you know, the Buddhist teaching of non-attachment, it's almost like it happens naturally because you realize this. You don't have to like, force yourself into not wanting something, you actually come to the realization that it's not desirable to begin with. And it's so much better to come to that realization oneself, rather than to be told, you know, that's bad for you. You know, you shouldn't really be, you know, doing that or whatever. It's another thing to realize, oh, that is not desirable. And so the emptiness is sort of, again, the, the beauty of it, is the it leads to that liberation from desire we're only halfway there yeah 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 i was also just thinking that uh just because you mentioned the phenomenology um i was thinking like it's kind of um ultimately it's seeing through the whole experience right um in terms of the, the whole thing and and when you as a phenomena, the whole experience, all of experience, um, since it's signless, it's desireless. So knowing that you can't hold on to any of it, uh, like every uh, every aspect of it becomes the like a celebration, right? Or like a full, you know, it's like a an explosion of just whatever arises, whether that may be good or bad or anything. But from a pure point of view, you know, it would just be no good, no bad. It would all just be just dense. <laughs> That's the equanimity, what you describe, this idea. Not good nor bad, but just this, this, exactly. That's the equanimity yeah. idea. And, and you wouldn't be like uh, grim about it, right? It would, it's more a celebration of the fact that there is all of this. Uh, yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It becomes wonderful, truly wondrous and wonderful in that way. And, and, you know, I, for anybody that's, you know, been listening, you know, paying uh, to my talks and stuff, this is pure land Buddhism type stuff. This is what they're talking about where it's like, oh, wow, everything is actually really crazy and beautiful and so full and da, 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 da. And you realize how the blinders of conditioning allow for such darkness in that way. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. Great comment. Thank you.
Can I? Yeah, no. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm I'm wanting to like get a little closer and more distinguish between maybe you've said it and I haven't heard it, but between it, you made the distinction between someone telling you this is empty, so don't desire it. Like end of story, can't you see? Right, which seems really unskillful, like for anyone, pretty much. And then there's like realizing emptiness and seeing what Ramit said, which was beautifully put, but it's still a sort of a intellectual exercise in a way. And then there's like, and of just a purely experiential uh, experience, <laughs> purely experiential mm -hmm. that comes from the, like you, you still have to, no, I mean, if you're the Buddha, you could have figured it out yourself. But let's say all of us need to have heard about emptiness like a bunch of times before it'll sink in. But then at some point, we have an experiential experience. <laughs> it's like you saying, <laughs> oh, we have an experience of emptiness that brings us to this place of an equanimous joy that then makes it clear that not only is emptiness uh, a, a truth, but that Mm. There's no need to desire things. And so I, I do you see what I'm saying. Do you see how I'm distinguishing between the second and third? Does that make sense to anyone? Does it make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally makes I'm sense. I'm curious, though. like for you, which one is it? Is it like, does it, does it have to be experiential or is that, or? You know, it's, it's interesting. No, I, I totally hear what you're saying. Um, you know, I, I, the way that I teach the, the big history of Buddhism in five minutes, it, you know, is the distinction between the early school, the later school, Theravada, Mahayana, all of that. But I often teach, and this is sort of the way it pans out in history, is that the early teaching was calm down, control your emotions, meditate, focus on your breathing, calm down, calm, keep calming, keep calm. And there was a way in which if you did that calmed and calmed and calm, you could have this insight of panna or pranya, this insight regarding shunya or shunyata, emptiness. And that it's sort of a, a insight arises through the cultivation, through the calming, through the eradicating the poisons and so on and so on. The Mahayana tradition seems to want to start with the realization of emptiness and sort of, I don't wanna say work backwards in a way, but sort of not wait for you to have the realization, but to sort of put it out there from the beginning. And actually Noam, what your question slash comment sort of reminds me of is the thing I was saying sort of towards the beginning, which is that this emptiness thing is kind of a, actually a different way of thinking. And what I mean by that is you do have Satori's, you do have these kind of realizations of, oh, wow, that's what the Buddha meant by emptiness. Wait, what did he mean by emptiness? Like it literally is just these moments. And what's happening there is you're actually thinking differently. And so it's not, you know, and I say this often too, that I don't have any information that I can give you to make you enlightened. There's no piece of information that you're missing. It's actually how we're, we are all thinking, that we think in a certain way. It's dualistic, subject object based. It's obviously kind of clouded and, and confused by the poisons and all of that. But the idea is, is that it's probably more helpful to realize, oh, emptiness, I need to think a whole other way. It's not just about some quantum equation that you missed out on. And if you knew actually that there was this amount of space between all the atoms and you knew that it was all space, that's emptiness. That's not emptiness at all. It's actually a different way of even just seeing the world. And so again, I think the idea is that the Mahayana, it just starts with that and says, let's start with that and then kind of work our way backwards. And one last thing known that I will say in, in in reference to your comment slash question, what I was referring to regarding this sort of 
the power, the power of the realization of desirelessness. I wanted to speak about that, that idea of like when one comes to the realization themselves, oh, this is not desirable. And it's not because anybody told me it's not, it's I actually realized that this isn't desirable. And a really good example is like maybe lying. And it's this idea that you can be told from the time you're born till today, you can be told that lying is bad. Then you shouldn't do it. And there's a way in which we're like, okay, respect, right? I should, you know, and it's like, you know, and so you do your best maybe to not do the lying thing, but you still wind up doing it for a variety of reasons and this and this and that. But there may hopefully come that day or that moment when you realize, oh, this is not desirable. This is actually not desirable. And then that's true like liberation from it in a way versus being told your whole life, you shouldn't do it. Da, da, da. So. Michael, I have a um, question to you and, and you, you can let me know if you don't want to answer it because it might be a little bit out there. So um, I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts around why human beings all have this conditioning you know like for me the question is is there a bigger meaning behind it thinking about if we use the mm -hmm. buddhist an 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 analogy um that um mind at large um is the ocean and the waves are um the individual um conscious uh, streams of consciousness so i'm wondering why i mean buddhism teaches us there's suffering to also to understand that um, we are free from suffering. So there, there's this place why suffering is experienced. So I'm wondering, you know, what I'm, where I'm heading a little bit, what is the grand reason that we all have this, you know, we, 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 we are, yeah, we still think that things make us happy or people. So, why is this, or in, in short, why do you think is there this collective notion of this belief? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you don't want to answer it, but it's also. No, uh, I'd love to, I would love to answer it. And I, I, I mean, I feel like I can in that way, but I mean, okay, so I mean, the, the answer is very simple. It's, it's called ignorance, avidya. It's, it's a link on the 12 link chain of causation. But let me explain, I'm not gonna do that to you. I'm not gonna be one of those Dharma teachers that just says ignorance. And I'm gonna be very clear about what I think they mean. I all, everybody knows I always love the dream analogy. So the dream analogy as it pertains to what is ignorance? Well, it's like in a dream where you find yourself in a dream. But it's one of those classic dreams that you don't know it's a dream. You think it's really happening. You think it's high stakes. And so the idea is, is that in this dream, that's a dream, by the way, there's something that you're afraid of. And the idea is, is that the only way that you ha are afraid of that is because of your ignorance that you don't know that it's a dream. If you had maybe a lucid dream at that moment and you woke up, woke up within the dream, you potentially would cease to be afraid of whatever it is because you would realize, oh, I'm looking at my own mind right now. I have no reason to be afraid of my own mind right now. However, when it's that dream that's a dream and we don't know any better, i.e. we're confused, i.e. we're ignorant, it's a very existential experiential moment and where we're like, oh shit, and we're booking it and we're afraid to death and that a fear is real. But why are you afraid? You're afraid because you're ignorant in that sense that you don't know it's a dream. You don't know that you don't have anything to be afraid of. 
the teaching is the same for this realm, this world. And as I always say, I'm not saying that this is a dream. Uh, the Buddha is saying this is dream-like. And that in a very, 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 very similar way, our fears of our, our, uh, uh, our fears are of our own creation. And we can stop being afraid anytime we would like in that sense. But it is the ignorance that keeps us from that. Because as soon as I say that, we can be, stop being afraid anytime we would like. Somebody says, but Michael, I've got X, Y, and Z to worry about. Respect, I know, I've got X, Y, and Z to worry about too. But the idea is the same is that actually the root of the fear, the root of it all is a confusion about what's going on here. And it's a confusion in many, for many reasons, for many layers in many ways in, in that sense. It has to do with fears of mortality. A lot of this has to do with fears of mortality. A lot of the self-preservation mode, even to the point, you know, it's as ironic as this seems to stuff your garage full of useless things is actually about mortality in some way. It's actually somehow about, no, no, uh, you know, if, if I have all this, they can't get me or something. I don't know. But again, and I don't exclude myself from any of this behavior, by the way, everybody knows that. I speak from experience. But Connie, I hope you heard my message regarding that the root cause of this is we don't fully understand what's going on here. And that's causing us suffering in that way. And to the best of my ability as a Dharma teacher, I'm trying to kind of explain what is going on here in that, in that sense. I don't know, but I, uh, Connie, we, we, you good? Uh, we may, might want to talk offline about it. I don't want to go deeper in it, but thank that's, you. That's good. No, no, and we should because I this I've this is a, a kind of a um, a recurring question with a, I've heard I know iterations of the same question, and trust me, it's a profound one. I I appreciate you continuing to come back to it. Now, I think, you know, my question was like, is there a reason why there's ignorance? So I understand that the root cause is ignorance. This is, you know, you, you talked a lot about it. It's the basic teachings. But is there a, re a bigger reason behind that we are all, that, that, that there is ignorance? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, du yeah, duality. I'm telling you, it's the subject object experience. Insofar as we say, I'm over here, the rest of the world's over there, and we split the world into self and other, that's it. It's also like a dream. It's why I mentioned the dream analogy, because even though in a dream, we are the, pretty good. even though in a dream, we are the creators of a dream, we still do this weird thing where we hold it at a distance. We hold the objects of the dream as if they are not ours, as if we have not created them. Let's sleep. And then we we get we get our own mind back at us, and we're afraid of our own minds, Connie. That's the idea. We are very powerful beings in that way, and there's a way in which I think we're afraid of our own creative power in that sense. So, I, I have I still have an idea. I need to finish. To Can so, Con Connie, let's definitely keep this conversation going. Any other questions, ideas, or comments about all that? Yeah. Can I can I add something? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I was also just thinking like um, in terms of um, like with duality, right? If that's kind of what we talked about yesterday too, but with time as well um, and, uh, and emptiness goes kind of hand in hand with that too because you look at something and you can be like, well, is this the past? Is this the future hand? Is this the present hand? Or is it hand or is it, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. and, and then, and, and by going through that, you can see the same thing with, with uh birth and death um right and so where did it where was it born <laughs> and and uh it's like even even the duality between experience and non-experience um that's also part of talking in experience mm -hmm. and so so the more <laughs> kind of unweave those it's like 
you you just recognize that it's it's like a it is like a rich dream that was just never hmm. that's happening but not to anyone just in a in a dark cave or <laughs> that's full of light and spontaneity and all of that so yeah <laughs> yep let me let me draw i since it's not too too late let me drop this one on on you so um it'll kind of round out these ideas so there's something that i haven't mentioned I, I i think i mentioned it in passing at the beginning there's one idea that's that's key to tonight's conversation and uh it's interesting because it you know again it's been dancing around and it's this idea of dependent co-arising, dependent co-origination, pratitya samutpata. And, you know, what, and this is another one that I can't, it's so hard to just, you know, start a conversation about dependent origination. It's one of those ones where as a Dharma teacher, I, I have, you know, carefully planned ways of walking us through this. But one of the ideas to think about dependent origination, it's again, it's key to everything that's going on here, which is that within that conceptual realm of reality, and by the conceptual realm of reality, I mean the realm of clocks and pencils and Michael, right? The conceptual realm of reality. And within the conceptual realm of reality, there is this principle at work. In fact, it's the, the great principle that's at work at all things in the universe. And it's the idea of codependent arising. And what codependent arising means, and again, this is complicated. So I say this in a very like uh, uh, prefaced way. What the co-arising means is, is that you cannot have the idea of a fingernail without a finger. And you can't have the idea of a finger and a fingernail without the idea of a hand. And you certainly can't have the idea of a hand without the idea of a person with a hand. And there's, so there's a way in which there's a matrix of understanding about all of this. What is a fingernail? Oh, that's one of those ideas that's dependent on a bunch of other ideas to exist in that way, right? Yes, but what dependent co-arising means in the context of our conversation right now is this it's a wild thing about the way the mind works. And what it is, is that the moment the mind has decided that this is a fingernail, people in the world and creation and and this and this and that da, da, and, and uh, uh, manicurists and uh, nail salons and da, 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 it just goes on and on. So wait, stop! It's too much. It's too much. There's too much from a fingernail. So that idea of like from a conceptual level, the moment you see it, it, the moment you're like, "Huh, what is that? Oh, that's a fingernail." You get the whole universe. The reason why I mentioned the dream analogy is because actually this principle, this law or whatever called pratitya samupata, dependent co-arising, it's exactly the same principle or law that's at work in a dream, which is that you're groggy in a dream. You're like, whoa, what's going on here? What's that? Oh, and you think you saw a fingernail and then bam, you're in a world. And what codependent arising is, it's a wild, um, the, the comment earlier about this kind of like flowing out of reality from everything, it's when you realize that anything as an idea is connected to all these other ideas. And you can't ever have one without the other. You cannot have, you know, even though we're in this crazy 21st century, there's a way in which cell phone and ear it's a phone for crying out loud, right? So there's a way in which it's all connected. And so you cannot have just cell phone without human beings, ears, communication, language, phonics, satellites, X, Y, Z, goes on and on and on. <laughs> Can I say one more thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I was also just thinking like uh, with the, the phenomenologi phenomenological aspect of it, 
um, like in direct experience right now, right? We could do the same thing where we would notice, hey, there's space right here, talking right here, but ears over here. And in the sense that um, even in the very like fullness of everything, even if you're inside it, outside it, or whatever kind of scale we use, all of that is still, uh, you know, like, <laughs> eating through itself in a sense <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, they call that the interpenetration of all dharmas yeah and it's a beautiful idea and and even you can you can feel it too right like if you walk past a tree or um you sit at the pond and you kind of just hear the birds there is something that it's it's almost like self-contained in a <laughs> sense that whole whatever that experience may be yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can can I can I just add to that? Yeah. Um, so, so my my understanding of why we humans don't see reality as it is, we have this delusion. Um, some some work from evolutionary psychology and has has kind of come to the conclusion, or at least are working on a theory that evolutionary, our brains are designed to only see a particular aspect so that we will survive. We don't see, so there, there are a couple of really good authors. One is Robert Wright, who's written a book called Why Buddhism is True, and he goes down this path explaining it. And the other one is Don Hoffman. I don't know the name of the book, but he clearly outlines why we don't see reality. And he doesn't do it from a Buddhist framework, but from a cognitive evolutionary psychology framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's something um, in, in interesting re, um, to those works that you mentioned, an interesting uh, corollary or thing to mention. It's, it's basically what is called, uh, it has a lot of different names, but it's sort of a sense of a law of equation. And the law of equation is this idea that you know, I saw, uh, I saw this one plant and it looked like this and it tasted like this. And when I ate it, I got sick. The law of equation says the next plant that I see that looks like that and smells and tastes like that, I shouldn't eat it. And there's a way in which that law of equation where we can do that, it, it, evolutionary, bio, biologically speaking, it may have gotten us this far but it is actually a kind of false way of thinking, meaning that it's sort of a presumptive way of thinking. And so what a lot of this sort of, in my opinion, by the way, this is just my opinion, a lot of Buddhism and not just Buddhism, by the way, but a lot of uh, spiritual traditions coming out of the world around, oh, I don't know, about 500 BC, 600 BC or so, a lot of those traditions seem to be about recognizing that there are these um, uh, habitual modes of behavior that kind of maybe got us this far. And by us, I mean the human species, that they got us this far. But maybe around 500 BC, civilization and culture and agriculture and all of that reached a point where some behaviors from our more fight or flight survival mode, some of those behaviors may have become detrimental to our well-being in that way. And, and what I mean is to give you an example, there is something that happened uh, and, and I'm not, everybody knows me, I'm not the biggest like believer in evolutionary biology and all that. So when I say this, I, I speak conventionally, but there is this sort of, um, conventional way of seeing how the preservation of the self. And it was like, if something came to threaten this, right? I was programmed to fight or flight, protect this or defend this. But an interesting aspect of the human being, while we're talking about human behavior and all of that, an interesting aspect of human behavior and the human psychology is the weird ability to extend one's sense of self to include oh, others, my family, and now my sort of my family unit, my children, my wife, there's a way in which I can have the same fight or flight mode 
but about them as well. So don't get close to my family or whatever. And I could even extend that sense of self to my larger community, my tribe, let's say. And now it's like, don't come near my tribe, right? So now it's like this. And the idea is, is that that ability to extrapolate, if you will, or extend that sense of self, that may have gotten, again, all of us this far. But what what I think the Buddha recognized, and again, other traditions, is that now what happens is, is that I can, again, I can fill my garage full of stuff and I can have a white picket fence outside of my house and I can identify with all of that as myself. And so if you come and you do something to my front yard, you have attacked me. You've attacked my being, and I will now come at you with two, you know, uh, to fighting because you've attacked me. And somebody's sitting there going, I didn't attack you. My dog just took a piss on your lawn or whatever. I didn't, it wasn't against you. But there's a way I hope you're seeing that the mentality that allowed for the extension of the sense of self may have gone overboard. <laughs> and so the Buddha was here to say, hey, everybody, guess what? There was no self to begin with. We were just creating that idea of self to get us far along in type of a thing. So that's one you know, idea regarding the evolutionary psychology idea. Thank you for the comment, by the way, Angela. I didn't finish my thought and I got to finish my, my because I didn't do the Dharma lesson tonight. So we had this wonderful, beautiful, uh, conversation about mostly emptiness, a little bit of signlessness, talking about wishlessness. And so this is only the first undertaking that the Bodhisattva does in the seventh stage. But I want to remind you that the way that this was structured is this. The Bodhisattva develops a mind well-trained in focus on emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness or desirelessness, yet they collect great provisions of virtue and knowledge. And I wanted to say more about this and go through a few more of these, but I'll leave it at this. What this kind of going beyond idea sort of seems to indicate is, and it's so important, and it's very, very important to, to those of you um, who, you know, you hear about emptiness, you hear about these ideas, and, and you have the concern about nihilism that many people have. And it's fully, it's a fully legitimate question to have of like, well, wait a minute, if everything's empty, and it, nothing really exists, and everything's just a big language game, then why bother? Or why X, Y, or Z? And trust me, I get it. And what this is sort of addressing is that, that the bodhisattva, clear eyes, understanding emptiness, yet still does virtuous activities, even though the mind of the bodhisattva would not distinguish a virtuous act from an unvirtuous act, would not fall into such dualistic polarities. But this again is where Buddhism is not nihilism. They are, they're, they are saying, do not forget what we are talking about. <laughs> we are really actually talking about not suffering. We're really actually talking about the sources of suffering. And so to cultivate not suffering would be in that sense, virtuous in that sense. And so that's this idea of like, but again, it's a paradox. The Bodhisattva vows to save all sentient beings while knowing there's no such thing as a sentient being. So it, it, it's kind of paradoxical. It's meant to be paradoxical. And I guess is my sort of final comment here, the idea of going beyond is, is from that seventh stage, it's not paradoxical. It's, it's actually, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. There's no such thing as a sentient being. That's why we got to save them all. <laughs> all right? It's like not paradoxical. And that's Durham Gama. So. <laughs> Upaya.
<laughs> and that's your upaya. Any other questions, comments, ideas? Indeed, upaya. Hey, Michael, it's Noe. Yeah, Noe. Uh, oh my goodness, what a what a wonderful conversation, and 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 uh, thank you so much. So much is said, Connie, and 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 uh, Rumi, and everyone here who's spoken up. Um, and and this, I I, I can't always come back to the wonderful simplicity of the four the four lines. If you can repeat the four lines, you. Yeah. <laughs> Life is like a bubble, <laughs> a, a boat of lightning, a flash, a phantom, you know, a dream. Um, and and so for me, this conversation is is always putting me here, wherever here is, is beautiful. So thank you for that, and you know, for giving us, giving me that tonight, mm -hmm. and all of you. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Noe. Uh... Yeah, and I agree, Noe. This has actually been a really, really delightful conversation. I was, it's, you know, what I hope for Dharma Doors in that way is that I can just be a catalyst for a good conversation in that way. Jimmy? Yeah, I just wanted to say that this was really, really an exciting evening, which is why I had my camera off most of the time because I was just like, you know, screaming to myself. It was uh -huh. wild. So great, so great. Thank you so much. Thank wow. you so much to everybody. What a conversation. Mm -hmm. um. mm. Yes, thank you. I love it when I attend um, classes where I feel like I'm 100% connecting and getting it the whole time because sometimes things go over my head. I mean, I just have to admit it, but this was perfect. I Thank you, it was wonderful. Oh. Thanks to everybody who asked such great questions. There are things that like I can't um, articulate, but you guys do it for me. So thank you. <laughs> Can I, I would also like to add, but you know, I, um, it's kind of poetic, but um, the whole, the, the whole thing tonight just kind of felt to me like, you know, the coming together of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, uh, in so many ways, you know, I feel like if it couldn't have been like a single person coming up with stuff, um, you know, it's the whole having the sutra there, having the drawings there, having the questions and the and having to explore through those questions collectively. I think that's exactly like what it's about. <laughs> So good job, everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got nothing more to say, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. What, a, what an unexpected, I really, I know, it's just so wonderfully, unexpectedly beautiful. <laughs> All right, folks, then that's it for me. Until the eighth, until the eighth stage <laughs> next, next Sunday. <laughs>